everyone, and welcome to today's edition of the 7 Investing Podcast, where we're here to empower you to invest in your future. I'm 7 Investing founder and CEO, Simon Erickson. I have been a fan of talking about the semiconductor industry lately. It's one that's fascinating on a whole bunch of different levels, and that's why I'm excited to welcome my guest today, Nick Rossellillo. Nick is the head and the host of Chip Stock Investor. You can follow him and subscribe to his channel there on YouTube. He's also a business analyst that's covered several different industries over the past decade or so. Nick, I know that you're a fan of the chip industry, though. It's really a, a nice pleasure to have you on the 7 Investing Podcast today. It's nice to be here. Thanks, Simon. Thanks for the invite. Uh, Nick, before we get started, I could not help but notice it looks like you are in an airport right now doing some exciting global travel. Uh, what's the story? What's going on out there? Yeah, pardon, pardon the noise, any background noise that's coming through. But yes, at the airport um, at Athens International, uh, have been in Greece for a couple of weeks, headed to Tirana, Albania to check that out. We'll see. We'll see where it takes us. But that's uh, that's where I'm at. A bit of global travel. I love it, Nick. And, and kind of the perfect segue to another global industry, which is semiconductors. Right? We talked about this a lot. Uh, the world is dependent on chips and there's more and more of a focus of this kind of going regionally as opposed to everything being produced in a certain area. We'll talk about that a little bit, but kind of what's your take at the 10,000 foot level? Um, I know that you followed the semiconductor industry for several years. What what should we, at the broadest sense, be paying attention to as investors? Right. Yeah, it's something that I pay a lot of attention to. That's the name, chip stock investor. I think the thing that really we need to pay attention to is you know chips are like the building blocks of all technology when you start to boil it down it doesn't matter if it's some trendy new piece of software or the cloud or if we're talking about electric vehicles battery technology it kind of all starts with the chip technology that's kind of the driving force here and i think we've entered a decade where if you think about the 2010s, one of the key themes was the cloud software, uh, changes in software. I think the next decade, hardware has a lot of catching up to do. There needs to be a lot of capital investment in actual hard assets. And I think semiconductor, the, the chip development itself, but, but also manufacturing of these chips has a lot of catching up to do. And if you hear a lot of CEOs in the industry talk about it, they think that we're going to go from roughly 600 billion in chip sales this year, 600 to 650. It kind of we'll see where that lands, but we're headed towards one trillion per year globally, just for chips, just for the little building blocks of technology. That's a huge increase, um, and frankly, we're not anywhere close to being able to meet that 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 demand for production. Um, thus, the Chips Act and, and a lot of kind of buzz buzzworthy news items are going on right now surrounding that. So I think that's what we need to focus on um, when we talk about the semiconductor industry. Yeah, it's a great point, you know, that you brought up the cloud industry, you know, which I, I think that maybe it might be underappreciated by many, just how much computing horsepower is going into that behind the scenes in those cloud data centers. You know, the Amazons and the Googles of the world that really just kind of had to do all the computing for all these workloads that are being done by every business out there right now. Super capital intensive, uh, super opportunity for the NVIDIAs, for the AMDs of the world, for all the chip designers uh, to get into that. And, and like you say, that's just kind of one sliver of, uh, of what could be upcoming, too, when you're talking about electric vehicles and Internet of Things and and everything else that depends on chips out there. So, so let's talk about three companies on today's show. Uh, Nick, you know, I know that there's a couple that, you know, we've been following kind of a whole bunch of them, but the first one you wanted to talk about was Qualcomm. Um, what, what is it? This is a, this is an established name. This is a large, you know, huge company, but uh, what is it that is attractive about Qualcomm if you're an investor? Yeah. So Qualcomm, if you asked me about it a couple of years ago, eh, it would probably, probably would have been my response. Um, you know, smartphones are tapped out for the most part. You know, everyone on the planet has a smartphone, basically. Uh, there's been this big 5G upgrade cycle the last couple of years, and that's been huge for Qualcomm as it has been for anyone involved with the smartphone market. Uh, whenever you have a big upgrade cycle uh, like this, the more advanced the technology, uh, the more content win a company like Qualcomm can get. Uh, but I think what's interesting is management has changed from a couple of years ago. They have a new CEO, Cristiano Amon. Um, 
their CFO. I've had a, a pleasure of talking with him a few times now. Um, Akash Palkawala, he's actually an engineer that moved his way up into the CFO. I, I think it's an interesting new management team that is that is coming at this from a different a different approach than Qualcomm has in the past. They're trying to take the same technology that worked for them in smartphones and apply it across the technology ecosystem. So be that IoT, like you just mentioned, Simon, Internet of Things, basically any device that we might interact with on the job or in our homes, getting a, a network connection in it, uh, to autos, the modern vehicle. It's, it's going to be connected. It's going to be hooked up to the cloud. It's going to be taking in massive amounts of data from the road. Uh, hmm. Qualcomm, Qualcomm, I think, is a really good mix of building really, really high-end uh, processors based on ARM. We'll talk about them here in a bit. Um, but it's also energy efficient. And I think that's something else the world has kind of kind of come to terms with here. Like one of the big users of, of power is technology. Uh, and this isn't just, you know, talking about, you know, renewables and, and, and climate change, but just from a user perspective, uh, something that runs out of battery or is not very energy efficient, like it's a killer, right? Like you don't, you don't want to interact with a device like that. So I think Qualcomm is a good combination uh, of computing power and power efficiency. And I think their chips are going to make a ton of headway in the coming years in these new departments. Yeah, and I'm glad you, you mentioned the upgrade cycle, right? I mean, Qualcomm was kind of the enabler of so much of that cellular spectrum. We went from 3G to 4G to 5G. We'll be at 25G at some point in the future there. <laughs> but it, it's leveraging, right, the IP. You know, they, they kind of built out a lot of the, uh, the necessary infrastructure for cell phones. But it sounds like from um, the investing thesis here might be is it's not just all about um, the newest Apple iPhone that's in our pocket. There are devices that need energy efficiency that still want to connect to that spectrum. There are vehicles. I know Qualcomm's been very focused on chips for cars. It, it sounds like they might be able to leverage that fixed cost infrastructure they put in place um, and get a bang for their buck out of it elsewhere. Absolutely. I think that's essentially in a nutshell, that's the investment thesis in this company. The infrastructure is there already because of the massive smartphone ecosystem that's already in existence around the globe. Why not extend it to other industries as well? Yeah. Is, is this a lower risk investment, Nick? Would you consider this a, a mid or high or low risk investment? It seems like Qualcomm's established, got some opportunities on the table. Where do you put this on the risk continuum? This is something more in the low risk bucket for me personally. I think that's probably different from investor to investor. But if you look at price to earnings, like what are they, 10, 11 right now? Price to free cash flow is higher. It's closer to 20. Those two will kind of converge over time, though. Um, that's maybe a topic for a different different time, why there would be such a big gap between the two, or maybe you've already got a podcast, maybe you've talked about it already. But low valuation, um, I think basically the market is factoring for a recession. They're factoring for a really big decline in smartphone sales, perhaps through the first quarter or two of 2023, without paying attention to the fact that they're going to continue to get the uh, the tailwind from the upgrade cycle and 5G for their smartphones, plus IoT and automotive are a really, really, high, really high growth segment for them. So I would put this low risk um, from a business standpoint. That's not to say that the stock won't be incredibly volatile, but I think the business execution, the bar set really low for Qualcomm at this point. Yeah, great point. A company, like you said, <clears throat> a mega cap company, you know, 10 or 11 times PE for an established business, lots of IP. Those are expensive components that are going into these smartphones even, you know, outside of the uh, the camera. I believe that the uh, the radios for the 5G connectivity, the, the, one of the most expensive parts of smartphones, and you can certainly translate that elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, great. Okay, Qualcomm, uh, lo lower risk, stable company, been around for a long time, might be worthy of your attention at 10 times earnings right now. Let's chat about another one, uh, Nick, that's also quite popular over the past few years, less popular over the past few months. Uh, that's NVIDIA, right? NVIDIA has been a market darling for a long time, but we've seen some volatility here recently. Yeah, I, I, I've i referred to NVIDIA as everyone's favorite semiconductor stock chart up until, like <laughs> you said, this year. 
uh, then everyone hates it because, you know, who likes 60% declines plus from all time highs. Uh, but yeah, NVIDIA, the company, NVIDIA, um, I think is building something. It was already a unique business because of the GPU that they helped pioneer. But I think they're building something truly new that doesn't exist yet in the semiconductor world. Um, and, and I think that's really not being fully appreciated yet by the market at this point. Can you elaborate on that, Nick? What are, what are they building that is that is completely unique in the semiconductor world? We know the GPU. We know that they've used it in data centers. seems like they have a lot more ambitions than just what they've been in the past, though. Yeah, they're starting to peel back uh, some of the, you know, the, the veil that they've had on this software business that they're building. So yeah. NVIDIA has always, and, and really maybe not just NVIDIA, all chip companies, um, you know, you design the chip, you have it manufactured, and then you package it with firmware. That's like the basic instructions that the chip uses to, to operate. You know, the, the firmware tells the chip how to, how to operate and interact with the rest of the computing system. But NVIDIA is taking it one step further. Um, CEO Jensen Wong said it at their GTC event last week, he talked a lot about NVIDIA becoming a full stack uh, developer. So they're not just designing the GPU, they're not bundling the firmware with it, they're also now building uh, software applications on top of that now. And some of them, uh, I think they have two or three now, you can actually purchase as a software as a service, on a software as a service license. Um, so they're also becoming a cloud computing company, a SaaS company, if you will, on top of the semiconductor business. That doesn't exist yet. It's really neat. You know, when you think about what Jensen built with NVIDIA, it really, he saw the opportunity to use GPUs outside of just rendering for graphics, outside of just video games, which was kind of the initial start for it. But he said, you know, if we develop this software ecosystem, called it CUDA, you know, you could code things for your application in C and Python, whatever language you wanted to, and then really, really optimize the way that those uh, operations were being computed by his GPUs. And it's amazing to see how he's built upon that. I agree with you that he's building something unique. He's always thinking like three steps ahead, it feels like, uh, of where he wants to go. And he's certainly been a key part of NVIDIA, just having your founder, you know, kind of the, the leader of this company for so many years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, absolute visionary. It'll be really intriguing to see where they take this software business, it's obviously not the only thing they're betting on because it's still a semiconductor business. Um, engineering new hardware is always going to be part of the game. Um, but one, what's one of the reasons we like software as a business model? It's like the most scalable business on the planet, right? Like you write the code once and then your only limit after that is like how many users you can distribute it to. It's incredibly profitable. So they already have the building blocks in place because they're a leading semiconductor engineer and now to build the software on top of it. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why people like um, Beth Kindig, who I, I think you've, if I'm not mistaken, you know, Simon, have, have had discussions Absolutely. with in the past, uh, says things like NVIDIA could be much bigger than Apple someday. We'll see, we'll see if that, if that happens, but you could you could see why such statements aren't completely far fetched if a company like Nvidia already has that base established and now they're going to put the most scalable business model on the planet ever invented on top of it. You can see it happening. The 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 other side of the coin I think we should address too here, Nick, because the bears out there are quick to point out that Nvidia is having some struggles right now. Uh, notably, the sales in its gaming segment are down. Uh, the Ethereum merge requires much less computing for uh, mining of cryptocurrencies like Ethereum out there right now. And then China is is kind of pushing back and, and kind of making it um, where they can't sell some of their uh, highest end chips into neural networks in Chinese data centers, uh, which was a key kind of kind of growth driver for them. Uh, do uh, what, what is your take on the recent developments for NVIDIA? Is it warranted that the stock has sold off so significantly? And do you think that these are um, short-term headwinds or are these long-term lingering issues? 
I would say both. I, I would say yes to both of your questions, Simon. Um, yes, I think it's warranted that there was a sell-off. Uh, like I said earlier, I think NVIDIA was everyone's favorite semiconductor stock chart in 2020 and 2021 without knowing anything about the business. And I, did it deserve to skyrocket? Yes, absolutely. Did it deserve to go up you know, several hundred percent in a very short period of time? The optimism was probably um, a little bit misplaced. So some of that optimism is, is coming back in line with what present reality is right now. Uh, but as far as the, the bear case right now, some of these issues are short term, and I think they're going to work themselves out because there are a ton of parallels with what happened in 2018, 2017 and 2018 during the last semiconductor cyclical downturn. Um, sales restrictions to China. Yep, that's when the U.S.-China trade war happened in 2018. This is not new territory. Uh, we had a crypto winter in 2018. So the Ethereum merge hadn't happened. Um, obviously, mining made a huge comeback <laughs> when the pandemic started. That's not going to happen again, at least for Ethereum, um, which is significant. But Ethereum's not the only company or the only crypto, excuse me, the only cryptocurrency that uses that uses GPUs for mining. We'll see how that pans out. Uh, so I, I think there's parallels to the previous bear market for Nvidia. It got clobbered in 2018 and through the first half of 2019 as well. Um, it was also down 60%. So this is not uncharted territory. I think many of these issues will resolve themselves. Uh, I think if, if Jensen and the rest of the company were really worried uh, <laughs> about just their demand completely evaporating, I don't think they'd be holding holding some of the uh, the big developer events that like they just did a couple weeks ago. I think they have massive potential ahead of them, and they know it. They just need to get the word out there to the developer community. That's a good point, too. Um... A company like NVIDIA is, is pretty asset light, right? They, they are doing the designing of chips that are manufactured else, elsewhere. They're not fabricating themselves. They aren't doing the manufacturing. And uh, so when you have kind of cyclical downturns like this, even as NVIDIA's stock price is selling off, it doesn't leave them in as um, perhaps awkward of a situation as a company like Intel is right now, who's trying to play both sides of the design side and the manufacturing side, even during a downturn like this. And I think that that plays to NVIDIA's advantage. Um, another one of the designers I've followed, Nick, has been AMD, who is uh, continuing to redesign the architecture for the chips that they're selling into the data center uh, for CPUs. Uh, but I don't think that those are really um, as competitive with NVIDIA's GPUs. I think that that's more of the expense of, of Intel than NVIDIA. I like that asset light model. It allows you to pivot in times of downturns like these. Seems to me like the, the long-term thesis for an NVIDIA would still be intact. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, let's uh, take a really quick break here, and then we're going to talk about our third company, which is Arm, uh, which is going to be very interesting because they're preparing perhaps for an IPO here in the next few months. But a very, very quick word from our sponsor. Our sponsor for today's episode is Zach's Investment Research. Uh, let's take a moment to consider the times that we're in right now. The current economic climate has people wondering, will this ever end? We're at record high gas prices, there's volatility in the market, there's inflation, and there's ongoing disruptions in the supply chain. Fortunately, investors like you have Zach's Investment Research, which provides in-depth financial data and expert analysis to help you make more strategic investment decisions. The Fed's doing all that it can to cool down inflation, and stocks have already started to respond. And when the market is gripped in pessimism, Zach's provides the invaluable resources Investors need to capitalize on volatility and buy stocks when they're low. They'll also help you spot losers so you know which stocks to avoid or eliminate from your portfolio. Experts know market volatility is the time to unearth great opportunities, and current conditions have done just that. So to provide value to our listeners, Zach's is providing the opportunity to download their report, Five Stocks Set to Double. For absolutely free, zero cost, and with no obligation, their experts are revealing the top five stocks with the best chance of gaining 100% or more in the next 12 months. I have looked at the list personally. I'm a fan of several of these companies, so I can attest that I really enjoy the list they put together here. 
Imagine how that could affect your portfolio or your retirement savings. Fight inflation and download your free report at zax.com slash 7investingpodcast. That's www.zacks.com slash 7, the number 7 investing podcast. Nick, let's bring it back to chips. Let's talk semiconductors once more and, and round this out with our third company. Uh, this is a company that NVIDIA tried to get its hands on uh, recently, was unsuccessful, but might now actually be spun off for an initial public offering, and that's ARM Holdings. Uh, what can you tell us about ARM? This is one that's been around for a long time in the chip industry as well. It has been, um, decades, and very few know anything about this company. Um, but it's a big deal. So we already talked about Qualcomm. I think, correct me if you know I'm wrong, um, but I think Qualcomm might be like the biggest developer utilizing ARM, um, ARM's architecture. It's a completely different business model than say um, Intel or AMD, like you mentioned, Simon, you buy a new computer or a new device and you have a sticker on it that's like, Intel or AMD is inside the computer, or even NVIDIA for that matter, there's a sticker that says, hey, this is the chip inside your device. Um, ARM doesn't operate like that. It's, it's what's known as a system on a chip. So rather than you know, a device manufacturer getting a license for the chip and then building the computer around it, ARM basically licenses the architecture and then a company like Apple um, Arm is the company that powers Apple's new M1 and M2 chips for, for their, their MacBooks and, and whatnot. Um, you're not going to see Ar an Arm sticker anywhere because Apple bought the license. They integrate it deeply into their system. And then Apple gets to say something really snazzy like Apple Silicon, um, when really it's like, you know, it's Arm's technology that made it really possible in the first place. But, you know, that's the beauty of a company like Arm. You're never going to see it, uh, but it's huge. It's everywhere. We're, we're benefiting from ARM right now at this moment, Simon. Um, this company is a big deal. There's a, there was a good reason why NVIDIA wanted their hands on it. Yeah. I always think about it as the building blocks. You know, If you wanted to design your chip and you don't want to just start completely from scratch, uh, you can work with ARM, license its architectures, for the designs of the chip, right? If you want to build a house, you don't need to make the bricks out of out of mud, you know, in Adobe yourself. You don't need to make all of the, uh, you know, the the foundation of the house or the walls, you know, out of, out of scratch. You can build pre pre made materials, prefabricated materials. Same idea with designing a chip. Uh, leverage what's already out there and kind of start from step five rather than step zero. ARM enables that. Uh, certainly has been useful for all of these tech companies. Nick, it seems like, like you mentioned Apple, not just Apple, but Tesla, uh, Meta platforms, uh, you know, there's a zillion tech guy, Amazon has have all been wanting to make their own custom chips lately uh, because they have applications that are large enough to support the cost to do that. Kind of feels like ARM is in the perfect position to capitalize on things like this. I think so. Um, and so I think your question basically boils down to you know, should we be interested in the ARM IPO? I think the answer is absolutely yes. Let's see if it happens. SoftBank is, who knows what they're doing, but supposedly they're planning this this uh, this IPO. But I think we definitely want to be interested. And I think oftentimes, you know, a company like Apple, it wants to design its own chips. It might be easy for us to say, well, Apple just wants to save money and design it in-house. But I think there's actually a much more important reason why there's this big shift to ARM-based devices, and it's because x86, that's the architecture that Intel developed all the way back in the 70s. That's mm -hmm. still the architecture that Intel and AMD are using for things like laptops and, and PCs if you're using you know, an, an actual you know, tower-based computer at home or at the office. It's not energy efficient, and part of it is the architecture itself um, the instructions that are used to run software on x86, it's not efficient. Um, there's a lot of redundant processes. It was not at all designed with today's mobility and app-based, um, mobile-based application in mind because it was the 70s and the 80s. Um, it, it's kind of outdated. It's on its way out. Even AMD made an acquisition of, of, of a, an ARM-based developer called Pensando earlier this mm -hmm. year. 
for a couple billion dollars, pretty significant, um, because they want to they want to develop ARM based processors for the cloud instead of the old x86 type. So even companies like AMD, I think, are recognizing that you know there's this is a significant shift. It's not just mobile devices, but ARM is also going to get applied to things like the cloud, internet infrastructure. Obviously, it's it's used in practically every smartphone and tablet in existence today. So why not use ARM for things like autos, automobiles, virtual reality headsets, augmented reality headsets like in, um, Qualcomm has started making. Uh, NVIDIA wanted to acquire it. We'll probably never know what exactly they had planned for, for that, but it's very significant. Um, I think we're witnessing behind the scenes quietly a very massive tidal wave sized shift from what Intel helped develop over the last three, four decades to this ARM-based ecosystem. And it's significant. Um, it's going to help continue to advance computing power, but in, a, in an inflationary period where if you're a company worried about inflation and energy prices, absolutely. Let's, let's get our tech ecosystem utilizing things that are more energy efficient to help keep costs down. Uh, ARM can help do that for these businesses. So it's, it's very significant. It's something where I think that Intel missed, missed the train on this one, right? Mobile, they totally missed it. You know, their, their chips were too bulky, too, uh, too, too power consumptive, uh, you know, and this was kind of the opportunity for ARM and for everybody else to custom design chips. Like you just said, energy efficient chips that had the perfect fit for the use case of a smartphone. I certainly think that energy efficiency is, is going to be remaining one of the most demanded uh, things for customers, especially as we start talking about the internet of things. And I think that ARM, as you correctly mentioned, is a, it is a good spot to capitalize on it. So, so what do we think, Nick? Are, are we going to see an IPO for ARM this year? You know, what is Masayoshi San thinking at, at SoftBank? Is this something that investors really need to be keeping an eye on and buy as soon as it goes public? <laughs> Uh, I, I got to put you I, on the spot here for this one. I know it's a tough call, right? <laughs> I think the IPO will happen, but you know, SoftBank's probably looking at the market right now and thinking, wow, we should have done this IPO last year, but you know, they thought they were selling to NVIDIA at a, at a attractive yeah. price. So, you know, that's them's the breaks. Uh, I, I think it will IPO next year. Personally, my, my philosophy is to wait I like to see at least a quarter or two of financial performance before I buy a fresh IPO stock. Um, I will say this, you may not necessarily have to go out and buy um, an ARM stock after IPO to get exposure to it because some companies like Qualcomm, for example, have said that they are very interested in participating in the IPO, in the actual IPO. They would be buying at the actual IPO price before the stock hits the public market. So. I think if you want like kind of a safe way to get in on ARM early, you could buy a stock like Qualcomm. If Cristiano Amon is serious, um, Qualcomm might make a sizable investment in ARM whenever that IPO does happen. Well, I think that the running theme through all of the companies we described is that there is a great need for computing horsepower for all of the creativity that software is unlocking right now. And the design freedom of companies like Qualcomm, of NVIDIA, that is enabled by a company like Arm, is certainly a trend that's just going to go continue, continue to go up in the future here. Uh, Nick, really appreciate your insights. Any final thoughts on what investors should be watching in the semiconductor industry right now? Yeah, it's, it's going to be rough, I think, for the next six months or so. Um, it looks like we're headed into a broader-based cyclical downturn for chips, um, especially on the consumer electronics side. That being said, it's possible the market has already discounted that event and a lot of these stock prices have already been clobbered. Maybe this is the bottom or close to the bottom. I don't know, um, but it should be a bumpy six months, though, while the market kind of figures that out. So I think that's the most important thing to watch right now at this moment with chip stocks. Absolutely. Well, Nick, have safe travels. Thanks again for having uh, thanks for being a part of today's seven investing podcast. Thanks, Simon. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Again, Nick Rossellillo is the uh, the host of Chip Stock Investor. You can check out his new channel on YouTube. He's got some great insights. I'm a big fan of the work that he's doing for semiconductors.
That's a wrap for today's edition of the 7 Investing Podcast. We are here to empower you to invest in your future. We are 7 Investing.